When you think disappointing games, what usually pops up in your head? Cyberpunk 2077? Fallout 76? No Man's Sky? Doom Eternal? There are countless options of disappointing titles to choose from, and today we'll be taking a look at one such title. A game that was lost to time not once, but twice. A game that is best remembered for having a cosmetic in a different game. That's right, we'll be taking a look at Brink, 12 years after it hit store shelves. We'll start with Brink's history and see why it failed so... You know what? No. I'm not going to board the Brink hate train this long after it's been dead, because that would just be beating a dead horse in front of a glue factory. The general public viewed this game as a complete letdown, unable to live up to the high standards its marketing had set up for it. The press surrounding the game at launch was, for lack of a better term, overwhelmingly pessimistic. Most gaming journalism publications gave it a 6 or a 7 out of 10 review, with a majority of them saying something along the lines of, Blink is an ambitious title that falls short of what it sets out to accomplish. It could have been really good, but it's just mediocre. And while I can agree with some of that statement, I don't believe that Brink is quite as bad as people made it out to be. It's far from a perfect 10 out of 10, either. We'll start with the thing I love most about Brink. It's price tag. I'd like a video game for when I'm this high. Okay, coming right up. What do I owe you? Nothing. It's for free. Free? Yeah, in 2017, Bethesda made Brink free for all Steam players. While this would read as a desperate last-ditch effort to save an already long-dead game, in 2023, this just means that Brink is a better alternative to your typical free-to-play live-service bullshit release nowadays. Don't believe me? Let's compare Brink to Overwatch 2. While not completely the same, they're both free-to-play class-based shooters that incentivize team play to complete objectives. Now, let's see what Brink has that Overwatch 2 doesn't. Visually distinct team design, character customization, a progression system, unlockable weapons, a fucking story mode. Speaking of, I love Brink's story mode, or lack thereof. I was being a little disingenuous when I said that Brink has a story mode and Overwatch 2 doesn't, because Brink's campaign is really just the multiplayer maps played in a specific order with AI bots. This is still more than Overwatch 2 was capable of doing with their lore, though. On the surface, Brink's story may look like a puddle, but with enough context clues, cutscenes, and audio logs, you'll find that this puddle is probably as deep as Mariana's Trench. In the year 2025, humanity, by its own hubris, was on its last leg. Most of Earth was underwater at that point, and any attempts to bounce back from the devastation had ended in failure. So, the wealthiest people in the world put their heads together and came up with a solution. I have an idea. Let's leave! The crooked bureaucrats decided to take a step down from playing God and gave playing Noah a try instead. They built a city that floats on water with enough space for a small civilization to survive through the catastrophe, complete with all of the comforts of first world living, like a mall and even an aquarium. The founders named this city the Ark. Gee, I wonder where they got that one from. As society kept crumbling all around the Ark, more refugees poured into the city, which meant that housing space soon ran out too. To counteract this, new guests would need to build mass housing spaces out of whatever materials they had on hand. As the years went by, more and more housing would be added onto these mega structures, until eventually, a whole second town emerged. This second structure would come to be known as Container City, not unlike the real life city of Kowloon in China. 20 years have passed. Rations are running thin and citizens keep getting less and less with each shipment. Civil unrest is at its tipping point, with civilians growing ever closer to becoming combatants. What started with just picket signing turned to stealing just enough food to survive, which eventually escalated to terrorist attacks with the intent of escaping the Ark and contacting the outside world. The founders of the city got fed up with these so-called protesters acting out and wanted to take the city back into their own hands. So, they formed the Ark Security Force, a team of volunteer cops tasked with stopping any resistance with lethal force and extreme prejudice. Their way of recruiting was simple. If you keep the people in check, you'll secure yourself food and water rations. But that's not to say anyone's very proud of joining up. One thing I think Brink's story does better than any other FPS campaign is provide enough narrative weight for its multiplayer factions to get you emotionally invested in them. 
This story is just morally gray. These lines are so blurred you can't see where one starts and the other ends. For example, some of your teammates on the security force aren't thrilled to be authorized to use lethal force on public transportation, and some even object to raiding civilian occupied areas like Container City. I have family there! So do I, but we have a job to do here. The same could be said for the resistance, with some lamenting that their family members joined the cops and they're afraid they might have to kill a loved one. My brother, he signed up with security. What if it's him in my sight? Others wonder if killing is really necessary to escape the Ark in the first place. Neither of these factions want to kill each other. But deep down, both sides know that blood must be shed if their goals are to be achieved. So they reluctantly march on, just following orders while telling themselves, Everyone in there made their choices. I said it before in my Crossfire Axe video. I personally love this type of writing when the writer gives the player a few different ideologies and lets them decide which one they believe. Brink's World is such a good one to tell stories in. I won't spoil the endings for a 12 year old game, but they're definitely some of the most underwhelming of any FPS campaign I have ever played. Toss in some unfulfilled sequel bait and ta-da, Brink's done. I could talk about how much I love this world for hours, but I won't anymore. Instead, I'll tell you how the game plays. Brink was developed by Splash Damage, I'm bringing this up now because if you've played any of their previous games, you'll know exactly what to expect here. Just like their previous entries in the Enemy Territory series, Brink has four classes to pick from. Each class has their own specific roles that fit into the game's mix of attack and defense objectives. Soldiers resupply ammo and planned explosive charges, medics bandage boo-boos and can cure death with drugs, engineers build turrets and defensive fortifications, Fortnite. Operators play on their phone. It's a game called Welcome to Bloxburg, and it's a game on Roblox, and you can build your own house or get a job like... Those aforementioned attack and defense objectives are pretty nifty. Planting a bomb, escorting a payload, etc. The way that Brink fits these game modes into the plotline sets them narratively above and beyond any of their peers. Instead of pushing a cart back and forward, you're helping an injured pilot. Instead of capturing a flag, you're stealing flight documents and launch codes. When you plant a bomb, there's a reason you're planting it, like blowing up a gate at the beginning of a match so you have an escape route at the end of the match. While it may have come out for the seventh generation of consoles when the generic modern military FPS was at its peak, Brink is not your typical Call of Duty style Arnold Schwarzenegger N-word simulator. You need to work with your teammates to win the game. The enemy AI is downright oppressive. They will gun you down without a moment's notice and will bum rush the objectives en masse if you even give them a chance to regroup. But, if you stick with your team, you should have a better chance of survival. Easier said than done, though, as the bots seem to prioritize doing whatever the fuck this is than helping you. Brink has a pretty respectable arsenal. You've got your typical FPS hierarchy. Pistols, SMGs, assault rifles, etc. But there's one gun on this roster that stands above the rest. A beacon of overwhelming strength with all the force of a freight train all conveniently packaged into the form of a gun. That gun? is the Mossington 12 gauge. Since their inception in 2001, Splash Damage had worked hand in hand with id Software on three of their franchises, and nowhere is this lineage more apparent than with the shotguns and Brink. Boasting a two-shot kill on most enemies, the Mossington is a powerhouse of a gun that can knock your enemies right off their feet. The look, the feel, the sound, all combine to create a buckshot blaster that can make even Blaskowitz blush. Follow-up shots are not required, but are so damn satisfying. Stop. Brink's biggest claim to fame was its ah. While not as mechanically in-depth as something like Mirror's Edge or even Parkour Fortress, Brink's parkour is some of the most fluid I've played in years. You can slide, vault, climb, wall run, and tic-tac off of most surfaces. Oh, and you can still shoot your gun while doing all of this, which feels just as awesome as it looks. With all this advanced movement tech, I'm surprised there wasn't a prominent trickshotting scene in Brink, as it came out at just the right time to get one. Need I remind you that this is a game that came out in 2011, three years before Titanfall would reinvigorate the FPS industry's love for parkour. So, in a way, Brink was ahead of its time. Brink's soundtrack is something I can say without a shadow of doubt is criminally underrated. This soundtrack perfectly embodies the bleak, morally gray conflict of its setting while still managing to feel empowering regardless. You've got pounding war drums, subtle strings, and bombastic brass. But if this were just an orchestral score, I wouldn't be very impressed. The game needed to do much more than that to impress me. And oh, how it does. 
Brink's OST is split into two halves to represent both sides of the Civil War. While both share the same motif and melody, each faction has its own specific vibe with accompanying instruments. The security utilizes ambient synths and electric guitars to embody a sense of clean professionalism. On the other hand, the resistance music combines elements from all around the world like bongos, handpans, and even Tibetan throat singers, all to rouse feelings of camaraderie and sow the seeds of rebellion. Brink has a specific motif that plays in every single one of its songs. Think of it as like a musical trademark. Once you hear it, you start to notice it everywhere. Menus, gameplay, even when you die, you're given the opportunity to play the Brink theme for yourself by switching between revive options. Nothing like real playable pianos in games, but still a loving touch nonetheless. You win this time, Overwatch. Brink has a metric shit ton of customization options to choose from. There are hundreds of costume pieces to unlock, each with 10 to 12 different color palettes and thousands of combinations to create. I fell in love with Brink's customization, and frequently found myself coming back between matches just to switch my character up. I haven't been this indecisive on costume choice since Halo Reach. Your soldier is pretty unique, and enough of a character to show up in the cutscenes. What the hell are you wearing? It's my ass kicking outfit, bitch! I found myself coming up with headcanon micro-narratives for my soldiers because while you're actively taking part in the story, this is still a plot-driven game, not a character-driven one. Your character is a blank shell for you to inhabit, so you gotta make up your own stories when you play games like this. I miss when it used to be socially acceptable to use your imagination. Customization also applies to the weapons as well. Each weapon has some unlockable attachments, but most of them do the exact same thing and only offer visual customization, so pick whatever makes your gun look the coolest. If you're a pay pig, there's also some cosmetic microtransactions. Brink had some DLC packs, but the only one I cared enough to buy was the Doom crossover pack, which gave me some themed shirts and hats as well as a gun skin. I'd buy that for a dollar. Brink had cosmetic microtransaction reskins three years before Valve would inadvertently ruin gaming forever with skins in CSGO. Just another way that Brink was ahead of its time. At the end of the day, Brink failed to capture the hearts of most gamers, but it still looked fondly upon by some. I never got to play the game in its prime to tell you how it was back then, but in its current state and where it's at now, I enjoy the game a lot, and I really wish I could have been there to play it when the servers were still up. How do you feel about Brink? Did you enjoy it when it was in its heyday? Or do you despise it with a burning passion? Let me know what you think in the comments. If you liked the video, please leave a like. If you didn't, tell me why. I'm always eager to hear feedback. Subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time.